afternoon. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about the New York Times building. Uh, I think to give some text about where we were coming from to where we were trying to get to. Maybe a little history will help us a bit here. So the New York Times was in a building uh, down, uh, down in lower Manhattan since about 1858. In 1904, let me see if I can do this. In 1904, we moved to the top picture you see there, which is the Times Tower. The Times Tower moved to Long Acre Square. When we moved to the Long Acre Square, they changed the name to the Times Square because the Times was there. We were there in 1904. We were in that building that you may not recognize, but every New Year's Eve, the tall part of that tower, at the very top of it, is where the ball drops. So picture being in Times Square, looking back toward the building, you would see today all of these lighted uh, advertisements, and at the top of it, the ball that would drop every year. That building really worked for us until about 1913, not very long. When we moved to the 49th, I'm sorry, when we moved to the 43rd Street building, and the one thing you'll notice about all these buildings is that they're very staunchy, very pop proper, if you will. Uh, so one of the things we thought about when we were talking about a new building for the Times is that we wanted a building that would change our culture, where our management would be closer to our employees. And at the time, we had employees scattered in several buildings within New York. So we wanted to bring them all under one roof. So we wanted to bring them all under one roof, at the same time change the internal culture of the company by bringing management and the workers closer together. And we wanted to change how we, view, how we were viewed by the community. So we wanted to be, there wanted to be openness, transparency, and these were the guiding principles that we were looking for when we were thinking about a new building. So we're in the newspaper business, the news business. Building a class A building in a major city is not our strong suit. So we went looking for a partner, a builder, who would work with us, but who was flexible enough to allow us to interject, if you will, our principles and our needs for what we thought we needed in a new building. Uh, and we teamed up with Bruce, Bruce Ratner and the Forest City Group to do that. So, let's see. We wanted flexibility. I think I've been through most of this. Um, one of the things that we thought about in the tower is that we wanted to bring our newsroom together. So our newsroom sits on, a, on the podium floors, which are the largest floors in the building. Then the business units were in the tower. But we wanted the floors in the tower to be flexible enough where all the different business units could actually live in harmony within the same space. Forest City, who was our partner, they had some spec offices in the building, as well as the rooftop and the rights to any of the retail on the main level. So to put some proximity of where we were in Times Square, we are, that's 42nd Street where you see the, uh, the line now. The red is the new building, the 8th Avenue building that we built. That is, the green is where you would find uh, the park. That's 42nd Street. There's 8th Avenue. That is across from us, 
that was the Port Authority and still is the Port Authority, which is one of the main sources of transportation for the city. So many of the subway lines and bus lines come through there. So that was a major thought for us. And the last two pieces you see there are where we were originally. So we're very close in proximity to where we were. Uh, one of the requirements was for us to remain in Times Square. After all, it bore our name. And so we wanted to remain there. So the schedule that we set forth was, we went looking for an architect who would work with us. And so we had a competition. And from that competition, uh, we completed that competition in 2000. Did it come up? There it is. Uh, the, divine, the design phase was to, from 2000 to 2004, construction 2004 to 2007. And we actually moved into the building uh, July of 2007. Our opening ceremony to christen the building, if you will, took place on November 2007. Okay. I'll turn it over to Serge. All right, so uh, one of the big parts of the beginning of the design is we need to assemble the, the design team. So we uh, ran the Piano Building Workshop from our Paris office. We led the design with Renzo Piano, evidently, and Bernard Platner, the partner in charge. We teamed up with FX Fowell, now FX Collaborative, with uh, Dan Kaplan and Bruce Fowell. Then Tonton Tomazetti on structure, uh, WSP on MEP, OVI on lighting, Gensler for the interior, and many other people that I'm not going to cite tonight. But this is my opportunity to say thank you to the New York Times and to Forest City for allowing us to design this building, um, and to thank also every single member of the team who helped us to realize this building and to make it possible. So every architecture tells a little story. And the story of the New York Times is one of lightness and what of transparency. You can, hear, you can see here on the screen uh, some sketches done by Renzo Piano where he looks for the grand idea of the building on little post-it, sometimes not larger than three inch by three inch. So transparent and permeable to the people, the building tried to express the interesting link between the New York Times and the city. So the building shape is very simple and primary. Uh, and it sort of uh, reflects also the grain of the city of New York and blends with the streets and the avenue with a very orthogonal geometry. The ground floor is the place where you can understand the most this concept of permeability. When you enter the building and the lobby, which is really open to the public, anyone can go and cross the lobby, you discover an uh, open garden, an exterior garden on the center of the building, which houses some, uh, you know, which is the home of some birch trees and grasses. This garden also is used as a backdrop for a 375 seat auditorium, which is used mainly for conferences and speech, but also for some music sometimes. So around the garden and along the street, you find a series of restaurants and cafes or retails. And along with the time center and with the lobby, they activate the street and they're making sure that not only the building is accessible, but also becomes a destination and reinforce the vibrancy and the activity of the street. The serv uh, services on the loading dock, you can see, are pushed back on the building. So you can also discover and understand this concept of transparency here with a 350 foot long axe of transparency from the 8th Avenue all the way to the back of the auditorium. And from north to south, you can, go from, you can see from uh, 40 to 41st Street uh, in the lobby, but also where you have some retail uh, where we define some transparency requirement, making sure that you would not block uh, the visibility. Um, the secure zone where the public cannot go without passing the security is limited to the elevator core, uh, where 28 high-speed elevator brings the people to the, the tower. On this section here, you can see how the tower is sort of lifted, floated ab floating above the ground to free up the space uh, uh, for the people in the lobby and give the transparency to the garden and to the time center. That's a view of the lobby. 
and you can see the selection of the finishes, which have been really um, uh, selected in order to express warmth and to be inviting to the public. It feels much more like a home rather than a cold corporate lobby that you can see for many corporate institutions. And this view, which is taken from the back of the auditorium, you see a long sequence of transparency with simple spaces, one after the other, starting with the auditorium, then behind you have the garden, then behind the lobby, and beyond that you have 8th Avenue, which is one of the very busy streets of New York City. So on one axis, when you are walking there, you do see also the variation and the multiplicity of function, which gives some sense of complexity and activity to the ground. So newspaper for us is also some sort of little factory making some news. And the center of the factory, as Terry was saying, is the newsroom. So it's located on the second, third, and fourth floor, and it's wrapping around the garden. It's also overseeing the street, and it glows night and days. We call it like the little magic lantern, because at any time of the day, you can see some activity and some light into it. That's a photo of the interior of the newsroom. So the design of the tower, the inside, the floor plan, has been governed by understanding the, on the working condition. So we try to put some emphasis on transparency, flexibility, ease of movement from floor to floor, still privileging places to have some intimacy. So the shape of the tower also facilitates to have some light penetration, this sort of cruciform shape. When you step out of the elevator, you can see the natural light on both sides. It helps the orientation. And all the offices, instead of being on the perimeter and blocking the light, has been pulled toward the center of the building along the core. Again, opening up the, the, the perimeter to workstation where the light can go deeper inside the building. And at the corner, you find like some stairs, which are not the fire stairs. They only stay here to facilitate communication between floors. So your, lead, your world is not limited to your floor, and then you have to take an elevator to go and meet a colleague, but you can just walk up or down the floor. And as journalists walk up and down, they are directly on the facade in direct view of the activity of the city. At every landing, you find a little informal meeting space inviting people to sit down for five minutes and exchange some ideas. And on the exterior, all the public and the city can again look at the activity and the movement of the, the occupant of the building. So on the 14th floor, you find the cafeteria. It's a double height space. It's located on this floor because it's a junction between the low rise elevator bank going to the newsroom and the mid rise elevator bank going to other floors, office floor of the New York Times. So this space is used not only as a cafeteria, but is really like the meeting place of the entire newspaper. And throughout the day, it's used for informal meeting or more formal events sometimes. So the top of the deep building is designed to blend with the sky. So you have the screen facade that sort of dissipates. And then you have a 300 foot tall mast, which is like an antenna symbolically connecting the building to the rest of the world. And initially the mast was designed to bend with the wind with the idea that if you are looking where the fresh air is coming from in New York, you would just look at the mast and breathe in the right direction. So this is Bernard Platner, the partner in charge, not only a great architect, but also a very enthusiastic Swiss mountain climber. So we couldn't resist, evidently, to the pleasure of climbing the mast and enjoying the view from up there. And we just pretended we are going to inspect the light, but it was just to take the view. <laughs> not sure really asked that we could do that. No, you did not ask. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> and that's my foot of it. I took the photo. So. <laughs> Uh, so in the competition stage, uh, we envision also a roof at the top of the building, quite different from the roof at the, uh, from the garden, sorry, at the, the ground floor, which belongs much more to the street. The roof garden idea that it's a place of serenity where you can enjoy the view of uh, New York City. It's a very spectacular space. So we have designed it, we had all the drawings, all the permits in place, ready to be built. Unfortunately, came the 2008 recession, so this part of the project is not done but it's all ready to be done. So if anyone in the room is interested in a nice little garden in New York City, please ask Terry. He'll be happy to talk to you. 
So the crafting of the detail is another very important topic for Renzo Piani Building Workshop, and in particular for this building. A building is made piece by piece. And we spend a lot of time and energy and passion in order to design every of these pieces to express the function it's serving and also to reveal how it has been fabricated. For example, the exterior steel structure that Amy was referring on the, this morning uh, presentation is very unusual. Usually the structure of the building of a skyscraper is inside. It's invisible. You don't see how it works. Here the idea was to take this skeleton and pull it on the outside of the building. And then it becomes like an open book. You can understand how the building carries its own weight. You can understand how it resists the wind. And it gives an ex architectural expression of the building. It becomes the architecture and creates a depth also of detailing. One year into the time frame when we were designing the building, 9-11 hit. We had to now think about the transparency, the openness, the ability to have the public transfer through our building. And we thought about it. We talked with our team about it. And we decided that we would stay with our goal and with our principles. That's not to say that we didn't do some hardening in places that are transparent, but we held true to our principles. So it's to be noted, it was an incredible act of courage of the New York Times at the time. You know, most of the institution were even wondering if they should stay or not in New York City. It was a lot of questioning about reinforcing or pacifying, putting a barrier between uh, the interior and the exterior of the building. So this commitment to openness and transparency, I think, is really remarkable. Yes. So. So in, in addition to the tower, this theme of transparency, the tower doesn't use uh, mirror glass or tinted glass, uh, but rather like very clear glass with a layer of ceramic on the outside, which plays uh, with a change of light in New York City. So this is how the facade is working. Evidently, one of the biggest issues for an office tower, a glass office tower, is how you resist the heat from the sun. And again, you can have smaller window or dark glass in order to create some shading coefficient. But here, the shading is pushed on the outside where you have a layer of ceramic that is sort of reflecting uh, the direct sun, uh, protecting the interior, and then the interior layer of glass can be extremely transparent because it's freed uh, from this function. The ceramic is also working as a little light shelf, bouncing the light back to the ceiling and penetrating deeper into the building. As you have more light in the building, all the interior lighting is dimmable and is on little sensor. If you can dim the light to save as much energy as possible and just to complete, uh, to have the optimum level of lighting on every piece of the, de every piece of the floor, floor, sorry. When you have too much light and you have some glare consideration, some interior automated shade, all controlled by sensor and computer program who can calculate the position of the sun, deploys again to make sure that you have the right amount of, of light but not too much. So instead of having a building which is like having some dark sunglasses that you keep all the time because you can't take them off, this makes a dynamic system. There is a raised floor system uh, used to bring some cables and data, but also to bring the fresh air. At the perimeter only you heat, and as the air inside the building warms up, it rises and gets returned at the ceiling. So it makes that the, the facade, the envelope of the building, with the facade, the interior shade, the lighting, and the air system is an interactive uh, multi-component item with each of the system reacting to the other to adapt to the optimum condition. And you can read again on the facade how it articulates and how you can understand what each component of the facade is doing. And you can see here again how the, sorry, you can see here how the facade picks up the light from the, from the city. On the inside, you have, again, a very clear glass and a great amount of natural light penetration. So this, facade, this system of complex facade would not be able to be developed without an extensive use of mock-up. See, in the design phase, the early stage of the design phases, we are making some uh, mock-up, full-scale mock-up. This is in our Italy uh, office in Genova. After you have the uh, contractor, the facade contractor, who makes some performance mock-up to make sure that it's performing. 
and the New York Times build uh, on their printing plan um, about a quarter of the floor plan of the tower that they use as a laboratory with the architect, the designer, the technician, just to make sure that all this interaction between the facade and the interior were working properly. And you can see here again how the facade is reacting to the light. So now we can check with Terry how that has been working for the New York Times. So, and I'll be quick because I think we're almost out of time. Uh, what we've done with our building is, as you know, how you present the news has changed quite severely lately. So we've gone from print to digital, and that has changed the way that many of our groups now work together uh, in the building. This is what our newsroom looked like when we opened the building in 2007. Here's a rendition of what it will look like when we finish it in about two months. It'll look this way. This will also represent what our towers will look like uh, as we go to digital. So what we've been able to do, because we've changed the way we work together, is that we've actually been able to put the same number of people into 40% less space, which now makes me be even more of a landlord, if you will. So we've got six floors that, we're, that we've leased out and another couple of floors that are available for lease. And here's a picture of the newsroom today at a celebration of the Pulitzers. And you can see how the community of the building comes together. That's more than just the newsroom. That's people from the tower who were able to come down and celebrate the Pulitzer Prizes. There are energy savings. Uh, what we did was at the outset, we brought in uh, the Berkeley Group along with the University of uh, uh, California to help us when, in, when we set up the mock-up out in College Point. They came back in 2011 and 2012 to actually grade how well we had done. And here's the report uh, that they put out on the savings. It's about 28 to 30 percent savings uh, from energy and that full report is available online uh, and I would suggest that you take a look at it. Uh, uh, the systems that we put in place were it was an integrated system. The underfloor air, the lighting system, uh, the shading system, they all work together to give us a, if you will, atmosphere uh, that our people really enjoy. Uh, and when you think about the glare of not having anything on those windows, I can tell you that uh, when they did the report, they found that only 18 times per year on average would there be intervention by our employees to change the uh, shading system. So the shading system where, where we couldn't actually grade it on its own, we could tell by how often our employees uh, changed it if it was working. This is the symbol that you see anytime they talk about new, the New York Times on any type of media. So the Times building has become, if you will, a moniker, just as we always wanted it to be. Thank you very much. Thank you.